I've played a lot of horror games in my time, and yet no matter how grotesque, no matter how gory or disturbing the stories in these games can get, probably the approach to horror that almost always gets under my skin is stalker horror. The idea of someone relentlessly following you with an ulterior motive is just so unsettling to me. It feels very real. Monsters, ghosts, and zombies aren't real, but what's to stop someone following you down a dark street at night? Who knows if someone has been watching you for days, weeks, months? And even if none of these things have happened to you, we can all relate to the paranoia of feeling like you're being watched. And I can't tell which is scarier, the fact you're being stalked, or not knowing the intentions behind it. Especially as a woman, these are frighteningly realistic fears that more or less all of us have experienced at one point or another. It's what drew me to the Clock Tower franchise originally, you know, probably out of a morbid curiosity and knowing that worst case scenario I can always turn off the console if it gets too spooky, but you could always argue the enemies in those games were always fairly one-dimensional. Scissorman is this goofy kid with the scissors hobbling after you, and hey, that might have been scary in the 90s, but I can't say it rattles me much now. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, they are pretty old games now after all, and storytelling has come a long way since then, but even playing them, I wondered if they could have done more with the stalker concept. Clock Tower more or less met its demise with Clock Tower 3, thanks to dwindling sales and a lukewarm reception, but Capcom didn't want to give up on stalker horror just yet. The early 2000s was a busy time for Capcom. Fixed camera angle horror was starting to get old, and so the company was hard at work trying to reinvent one of their flagship franchises, Resident Evil. They wanted to make sure Resident Evil 4, the newest entry at the time, would breathe life back into the franchise. This game went through a lot of chopping and changing before getting the masterpiece we got in 2005. In fact, apparently four different concepts of the game existed before they settled on the final version, the most well-known concept being the third iteration, the Hookman version as it's called, which would bring a more paranormal element to the story. Yasuhisa Kawamura, one of the game's scenario writers, elaborated on what this early concept would include. Leon infiltrates the castle of Oswell E. Spencer seeking the truth, while inside a laboratory located deep within, a young girl wakes up. Accompanied by a B.O.W. dog, the two start to make their way up the castle. Unfortunately, there were many obstacles that needed to be overcome, and the cost of development was deemed too expensive. One of these early concepts was also going to feature a brand new character who would have superhuman powers, but the team felt that these ideas were straying too far from the survival horror roots of Resident Evil, and so they convinced the writers to create an independent video game with these ideas instead. This game ended up becoming the stylish hack-and-slash action game Devil May Cry. And you can really see its relations to Resident Evil 4 as well, with the spooky castle setting, creepy enemy design, and overall ambience. The first Devil May Cry could easily pass as a horror game. But what a lot of people don't know is these ideas were used once more to create another game. This time a full-blown horror game, once again drawing inspiration from the castle concept and following a young girl waking up in a strange place with only a dog as her companion. While Devil May Cry went down the flashy, stylish action route, this game was going to do the exact opposite. In a similar vein to Clock Tower, this game would leave you no option but to run and hide from your attackers. This game was Haunting Ground. As you probably guessed by that description, Haunting Ground is heavily inspired by Clock Tower, a franchise Capcom had previous involvement with, having co-developed Clock Tower 3. And even all these years later, there are many people who consider Haunting Ground to be canonically part of the Clock Tower franchise, and admittedly, I never agreed with this train of thought. Basically, every RPG ever has taken some kind of inspiration from Final Fantasy, but does that make all of those games Final Fantasy spin-offs? No, absolutely not. Much like how Clock Tower was an homage to Dario Argento's 1985 horror film Phenomena, Haunting Ground is an homage to Clock Tower. But that's just my opinion on the matter. Regardless, as a big fan of both games, I will definitely be drawing comparisons between the two throughout the video because y'all know us Clock Tower fans do be starving for content out here. Haunting Ground released only a month or two after Resident Evil 4 in early 2005, and as you can imagine, was very much overshadowed by it. Thanks to a lack of marketing mixed with a lukewarm reception from critics, there was just no reason to go for Haunting Ground when the critically acclaimed genre-defining title that is Resident Evil 4 was sitting right next to it on the game store shelf. That, and we were still in an era, unfortunately, where female protagonists were just not taken seriously in games. The producer, Tatsuya Minami, even admitted that they mainly added the doll companion to Haunting Ground for fear that a female protagonist would be unappealing to both retailers and players, so it seems the odds were very much stacked against it at its time of release, and it quickly faded into obscurity. But today, it's time to give this game the spotlight it deserves, so let's dive into Haunting Ground to see what this cult horror classic has to offer. This intro pulls no punches. 
As soon as the opening starts, we see a young girl walking barefoot down blood-red hallways, interspersed with intimate close-up shots of her body. Before anything's even happened, we can already tell this game is not going to hold back with its imagery. I don't know if this is intentional or not, but this intro really reminds me of Clock Tower The First Fear's PS1 opening, with the ominous hallway shots and the ending shot on the protagonist. It could be a stretch, but I like to think this could be a nod. The game starts us with a very unsettling scene of a large, hulking man chopping up some meat in an underground cellar. In a nearby cage, we see our protagonist Fiona waking up, and we're plunged straight into gameplay. First things first, damn, what a beautiful game. This is a very late PS2 title, but it's safe to say Capcom were pushing the hardware to its absolute limits. The expansive areas and detailed environments are just wonderful on the eyes. This game features a more dynamic camera angle than earlier Capcom horror titles, or as I usually just call it, semi-fixed camera angle, where the camera is fixed to one spot, but it does pivot and follow the character much more than, let's say, Resident Evil 2's more static camera. Haunting Ground's camera angles are more akin to Resident Evil Code Veronica, <coughs> aka the best Resident Evil, but that's a topic for another day, right? Entering the nearby castle, we soon come across a strange maid who offers us some clothes. She talks and acts in a very inhuman, robotic way, and when Fiona asks her for help, the woman only stares at her with cold, soulless eyes, leaving her alone once again. Now is a good time to point out that the cinematic director for this game was Naoto Takenaka, a prolific Japanese actor and director. He placed a great emphasis on making each character in the game have a very distinct presence during cutscenes, taking great inspiration from 1930s horror classics like Frankenstein and Dracula to achieve this. The cutscenes feel very theatrical as a result, and it really helps each interaction feel very different from the last. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but until then, keep an eye on the cutscenes and you'll see what I mean. Regardless, Fiona decides she has no choice but to cut through the castle to find her way out, before she quickly runs into the same man from earlier. Much like the Clock Tower franchise it takes inspiration from, there is no real combat or weapons in Haunting Ground. Your only option, really, is to make a break for it and find somewhere to hide. Something unique to this game, though, is the fact that Fiona does gradually get fatigued as she runs, which is something you have to take into consideration while searching for refuge. You can make use of a variety of hiding spots around the castle, under a table, under a bed, behind a shower curtain, whatever it takes to conceal yourself. These hiding spots aren't indicated by an obvious green symbol like they were in Clock Tower 3 either, for example, and that adds to the panic even more, especially when you know a stalker is hot on your tail. Once you find a hiding spot, you'll get a POV camera of your surroundings, and you can only hope and pray that they don't find you. It's definitely encouraged to be a little strategic as well. Instead of just using the dedicated hiding spots, you can also crouch behind furniture or objects, and Haunting Ground definitely encourages you to mix up your patterns a little bit during gameplay. Hiding out in the open like this can work like a charm and give you a few seconds to make a break for it, but it's obviously the much more risky option. This system manages to strike a wonderful balance in difficulty here, in my opinion. Figuring out the hiding spot in a room, especially in the heat of a chase, encourages quick thinking and panicked decision making, but it doesn't go so far as feeling unfair or unforgiving. Haunting Ground could easily have been a frustrating mess had they made the hiding spots too few and far between, but thankfully I always felt like I had options whenever a stalker found me. Also, side note, this game has zero loading screens. Like, once you load your save, there are absolutely no more loading screens during gameplay. And not only that, I encountered zero glitches or hiccups at all, graphical or otherwise. This game runs like a dream and is really well optimized for the hardware it came out on. It could genuinely pass for an early PS3 title and even put some modern games to shame with its attention to detail. <laughs> Capcom really are the goats for a reason. Anyway, regardless of how you choose to hide though, you need to be pretty quick about it because of the game's panic system. 
During a chase, Fionn will gradually get more and more panicked because of her pursuer. The screen will slowly lose colour and become saturated, Fiona's heartbeat will become louder and faster, until eventually she reaches her breaking point and lets out a loud scream. When this happens, the screen becomes massively obscured and Fiona won't stop running, becoming way harder to control and much more prone to tripping or knocking into things. If this happens too much, she falls to the ground and it's as good as a game over, as you're wide open to the stalker landing their finishing blow. All you can really do when Fiona's panicked like this is steer her out of harm's way until she calms down. It's basically a much more elaborate version of the panic system in Clock Tower 3, though I could totally see this mechanic having a bit of a learning curve, especially if you're a newbie to this era of horror games. The biggest thing I like about this mechanic, though, is the fact that Fiona's anxiety and fear is communicated visually. Capcom could have easily gone the lazy game design route and just slapped a panic meter in the top left corner, but they decided to visualize it in a way that is both more creative and very appropriate to the in-game situation. The stark, jittery visuals, the audio sounding muffled, the pure horror in Fiona's cries are a much more effective way of showing us how she feels and instilling a similar feeling of anxiety in the player. I mean, think about it. If you were running for your life from someone relentlessly chasing you in a completely unknown, otherwise abandoned castle, your heart would be pounding in your chest. You probably wouldn't even be paying attention to your surroundings. You'd be so terrified you'd lose your footing. All your brain is focused on is getting away. This panic system perfectly embodies how this more than likely feels. Even the most seasoned, calm and collected horror veterans will have a moment of panic during a chase, like, oh god, do I go left here? Should I go right this time? Oh man, I hid in the corner last time, but maybe I should hide under the bed this time. Even when I knew the areas quite well, I still had to weigh up my options and decide the best course of action on the fly. I just really wanted to geek about the design here. It's really sick, and I just think Capcom nailed the chase mechanics, especially so considering the age of this game today. This is all enhanced by the enemy's behaviour, which feels very dynamic and unpredictable. If you use the same hiding spot too often, for example, they'll catch on pretty quickly. If you dawdle in the same area for too long, the enemy will eventually come across you as they're constantly patrolling the grounds. As you progress further and further, the stalker can become more violent. Debilitus, the first stalker for example, becomes more aggressive as time goes on, racing after you and becoming much more prone to swiping and attacking you, making him harder to shake off while in pursuit than ever before. Though it's not a totally hopeless cause, there are some cues you can use to your advantage during gameplay. If you happen to enter a room and the enemy hasn't spotted you yet, the ambient background music will completely fade out and you'll only hear their footsteps, giving you a chance to assess your situation and find the best course of action to escape. Even while in chase, the music will dynamically change. It'll speed up, slow down, become louder and more abrasive, or softly fade out depending on how close your pursuer is. Not only does the constantly changing music add to the chaos, but it's a great auditory indicator of how close you are to danger. You know once the music completely fades out that you've lost the enemy and can get back to what you were doing. According to the sound designer for Haunting Ground, Hideaki Utsumi, this was achieved by using the built-in sounds of the PS2 as opposed to audio files, which was the only way possible with the hardware to make the music change tempo in correlation with the enemy approaching you. This was apparently the last Capcom game to do so. And on the topic of the music, wow, this is definitely a very unique soundtrack to say the least. Much like the way the panic system is visualized, I feel like the music goes a long way too in capturing the complete chaos of a chase. Each stalker gets their own dedicated track, each one very distinct from the last, and they're definitely one of the most memorable parts of the game for me. Maybe it's just my Silent Hill brain rot and the fact that franchise has completely destroyed my taste in music, but I found myself bopping along to these songs quite a bit during gameplay. The only caveat of this whole chase system is that when you're in the middle of a chase, you basically can't interact with anything at all. Fiona will just outright refuse to interact with puzzles or key items when mid-chase, which, you know, does make sense, I mean, you are seconds away from getting your ass beat, but it can also be a little bit frustrating. You could be just about to unlock a door or solve a puzzle and, oh, oh there's the enemy, there goes the music, now I gotta go on a wild goose chase back to a hiding spot. This could be especially frustrating on a first playthrough when you're still learning the layout of the castle. It just feels like a 
limitation that doesn't really need to be there. I mean, if I'm this close to a door and I'm about to unlock it, but I just happen to be near a stalker, Fiona should still be able to unlock the door. I mean, come on, man, that would have saved a lot of headache. You do have one more trick up your sleeve, though, and that is Huey. Not too long into the game, you find Huey in the garden area, and he becomes your companion for the rest of the game. This isn't an escort mission or anything, though. Huey is essential for progressing through the game, as a good majority of the puzzles require him in some way or another. It could be him grabbing an item out of reach, or having him explore an area that's too unsafe for Fiona. A lot of the game is designed around cooperating with Huey so that you can both escape the castle together. He can even attack a stalker for you, giving you a few precious seconds to run away. You can order him to go, stay, scold him, or praise him depending on his efforts, and you're probably wondering why the hell you would ever really want to scold him. Well, that's because of the game's invisible friendship system. Depending on how you treat Huey, he'll either be more willing to help you or more stubborn. At the beginning of the game, he's always a little bit unruly, mainly because he doesn't know you yet, but if you praise him after helping you, he warms to you more and in turn will be more likely to listen to commands. Naturally then, if you treat him poorly, he will straight up ignore your commands and overall make the experience a hell of a lot more frustrating, so you know what you gotta do. That being said, I never personally felt much need to scold him. I didn't like having to do it for starters, and generally speaking, if you praise him enough, he cooperates just fine, so I left it at that. Either way, Huey adds another layer of complexity to the game that I very much appreciate, and the fact he can attack enemies especially is a nice crutch for someone who may be struggling a bit more than others. Okay, so there are technically other enemies in the games too, but I don't even really class them as such, they're just kind of more like <laughs> nuisances. There's these little glowing orbs you come across really early on called Luminescence. Think like a really angry Navi. Hey, listen! <laughs> They slowly gravitate towards you and don't necessarily deal damage per se, but they can raise your panic and if a stalker's nearby they can hear Fiona's yell, so it's generally best to avoid them, which is not all that hard. They move pretty slowly and as long as you close the doors behind you, they literally can follow you. I can see why these enemies were included, you know, probably so that there's still some form of threat even when a stalker isn't around, but in terms of their design, I just found them a little underwhelming compared to the actual villains. They can also crop up in really inconvenient places, like you could be in the middle of trying to do a puzzle and there's one slowly making its way over to you so you kind of just gotta shimmy around them. I don't know man, they're kind of lame, but not frequent enough that it's a massive problem. There's also these ugly little fetus monsters you encounter way later on that just grab onto your leg like a little kid. Again, they mainly just exist to get the stalker's attention, but they can be punted to infinity and are probably the least common enemy, so it's no biggie. Mm, puzzles, yeah, let's talk about puzzles for a minute. There can be some real head scratchers in Haunting Ground. It definitely requires you to think outside the box a little more than your standard horror game. Some of the puzzles rely on Huey, as I mentioned, and usually are standard go get the item I can't reach type beats, but others can be a little bit more complex. This puzzle in particular gave me a bit of trouble on my first run. You need to run around to different alchemy machines in the area to eventually synthesize a stone needed to exit the castle grounds, but you kind of have to decipher fairly cryptic descriptions to do so. Definitely some real brain teasers in here, which is a welcome change from the usual find key, use key progression of so many survival horror games in this era. Alchemy, in fact, is very central to the plot of Haunting Ground, as we will discuss a bit later, and I find it really refreshing to see this kind of plot in a horror game. I always felt alchemy was a severely underutilized concept in video games, considering the complete freedom and scope of stories you could do with it, especially so in a horror context, so it really helps Haunting Ground stand out from the crowd. It's even got its own dedicated little mechanic in-game. If you crawl through these holes in the wall- Holy shit, is that a Silent Hill 4 reference? You can collect medallions and use them on this alchemy machine, but dear god, the game explains it poorly. I'm pretty sure you click to stop the circle rotating and I presume match up as many of the same color as you can, but jeez, I could just not get this to cooperate for the life of me. And to be honest, as long as you explore sufficiently, you really don't need to rely on this minigame very much. You find plenty items through natural exploration as long as you don't rush, so save yourself the headache and just act like this little minigame doesn't exist. But what actually happens in Haunting Ground? Why are all of these people hunting Fiona down? I think it's about time we talk about the story in Haunting Ground, so obligatory spoiler warning, you have been warned. Skip to here to avoid any and all story discussions. Okie dokie, let's go. The basic progression of Haunting Ground is actually quite straightforward. A lot of the plot and its finer details are fed in a very subtle and minimalistic way, either through character behaviour or just implied through dialogue, and I like that a lot. It's one of those games where every person can come out of it with a different interpretation, and much of the story, its characters and the underlying themes invite plenty of discussion. With that in mind, let's run through the basic plot before we delve into the finer details. 
While searching for a way to escape with Huey, Fiona encounters all of the Belly Castle residents, the first being Debilitus, the gardener. He's a large man with seemingly the mind of a child, and seems to see Fiona not as a person, but as a doll for him to play with. During this time, we also briefly encounter Ricardo, the keeper of the castle, who tells Fiona that both of her parents died in a car crash while she was brought to Belly Castle while unconscious. He also shows us a stone statue of a heavily pregnant woman, telling Fiona rather ominously that this is what she is destined to become. We're also contacted by a man named Lorenzo, who wants to help save us from Ricardo and tells Fiona to aim for the mansion beyond the castle, where he'll help her find an escape route. Debilitus eventually corners us in the chapel, and for such an early point in the game, your actions here can greatly affect the ending. You can either hurt Debilitus enough that he'll back down and stop pursuing you, or just kill him outright. Assuming you decide to spare him, he'll no longer trouble you for the rest of the game, seemingly acknowledging what he did was wrong. Shortly after, we encounter the castle maid Daniela. While she pursues Fiona much like Debilitus did, her reasons are much different. She seems jealous of Fiona, and says that despite being crafted to be the perfect woman, she cannot experience pleasure, pain, or virtually any other human sensation for that matter. Reaching her breaking point, she hunts down Fiona to get the one thing she believes will finally make her complete. Her womb. After much chasing around, Daniela finally corners Fiona, riddled with jealousy and hurling abuse at her for being a complete woman, something Daniela has never been able to achieve. Fiona doesn't intend to kill her, but during the fight the ceiling shatters and a large shard of glass pierces through Daniela's body, killing her. Shortly after this, Fiona comes across an area filled with laboratories and alchemic machinery. This is where she meets Ricardo again, who tells her that she has the power of the Azoth within her, something he clearly wants. Fiona is still not entirely sure what this Azoth is or what it means, and runs away when Ricardo starts to become violent. He chases her into the nearby forest, and reveals to her that he is a clone of her father, Ugo. Escaping him once more, Fiona makes it to the top of a nearby tower where she extends the bridge to the neighbouring mansion, and in an act of self-defence, she pushes Ricardo off the building, leaving him to plummet to his death. Finally making it to the mansion, Fiona meets up with Lorenzo, the man who promised to help her escape earlier. He's an elderly man who tells Fiona that he created both Ricardo and Ugo through alchemy, but Ugo defied Lorenzo's wishes, leaving the castle to live a normal life, eventually meeting Ayla and having their child Fiona. Having inherited the Azoth from her father, Lorenzo forcefully brought Fiona back to the castle to finally make use of that Azoth as he originally intended. Being a great alchemist, we learn that Lorenzo is able to control his aging process at will, as he gradually de-ages with every encounter. The story comes to a climax when Fiona manages to push Lorenzo into a lava pit. Lorenzo resurrects one last time as a flaming skeleton, chasing Fiona through the crumbling halls of the castle before finally succumbing to the embers, dying while trying to block the exit. Fiona approaches the castle gates, trembling after everything she's had to go through, but finds comfort in Huey, the only one who stayed by her side and looked out for her since the very beginning. There are four endings in this game, and in what I would argue is the best ending, Debilitus passes Fiona on his way to do his everyday tasks. He bows to Fiona, conveying his respect and perhaps even admiration for her, and goes on his way, not getting in the way of her escape. Fiona looks back one last time to call Huey before stepping outside the grounds, leaving Belly Castle behind her at last. The game ends on a shot of Debilitus cutting the trees in the castle garden, humming to himself contentedly as he is the last person left alive in Belly Castle. On the surface, Haunting Ground is a very straightforward story. If you just want to take it at face value, it's a simple plot following a girl held hostage by a bunch of crazies in a castle, but that's just not giving it the credit it deserves. The game is rife with underlying themes and commentary on womanhood, bodily autonomy, objectification, and societal views of women as a whole. And simply put, Haunting Ground was years ahead of its time in this regard. In order to fully appreciate these themes though, let's address some aspects of the story. As I mentioned earlier, alchemy is at the very heart of Haunting Ground. For anyone who may not be familiar with it, alchemy is an ancient practice that was most common from the 1300s to the 1700s across most of the world. Alchemy blended concepts of science and philosophy, and the end goal, among some others, was the creation of the elusive elixir of immortality and the creation of panacea, a remedy that could cure any and all diseases. In most modern media, alchemy is often oversimplified as just magic, but you have to remember that, at least in Europe, alchemy was at its prime at a time in history when magic was still widely believed by the masses. So while it may sound absurd and almost laughable now, alchemy was a very legitimate field of science at the time, sowing the seeds for medical and scientific practices still in use today. So then, the Azoth, the word all the characters keep name-dropping throughout the story. What's the deal with that exactly? 
Well, believe it or not, the Azoth is actually a real concept in alchemy as well, and the more well-known alternative name for it would be the Philosopher's Stone, something you've definitely heard of in films, books, or games. In the world of alchemy, however, Azoth was one of the most sought-after goals of the practice, regarded as the universal life force, the animating energy that empowers the body and mind, a mysterious evolutionary force in every human, animal, and thing on this earth. One of the most prominent figures in the field, the Swiss alchemist Paracelsus, apparently achieved the Azoth in the 1500s, and this alchemist's triumphs were a major inspiration for the story in Haunting Ground. In Haunting Ground, however, the concept of Azoth has been adapted slightly. It is still highly revered and sought after by the residents of Belly Castle, but the traditional idea of Azoth is married with the concept of human reproduction. Fiona's Azoth is implied to be inside her womb because, after all, Azoth is the essence of life and all life starts in the womb. But why does everyone want the Azoth? Ricardo and Lorenzo seem to imply it'll grant eternal life, but what for? Why would you want eternal life? It's revealed to us that Lorenzo wants to discover the great truth. While it's never explicitly revealed what this means exactly, we can safely assume it's something along the lines of discovering the meaning of life, if there is a greater power in this world, and if so, who that greater power may be. Pursuing this great truth could take decades, centuries, or millennia, and so Lorenzo and his lineage want to make use of Azoth to grant themselves eternal life in order to continue this pursuit of the truth. This Azoth, however, is exactly the root cause of everything Fiona is put through in the events of the game, which leads to probably the most central theme in Haunting Ground, objectification. Fiona is not seen as a human with free will and a right to decide her own future. She was brought to the castle by Ricardo and Lorenzo for her Azoth and nothing else. Whether or not she consents to what comes after is not relevant to them. As soon as she's brought there, she has no autonomy over her body, but rather is just seen as a vessel for their personal gain. There are a multitude of examples of dialogue throughout the game that communicate this point loud and clear, but probably the most on the nose line is said by Lorenzo in the last stretch of the story. Uh, Fiona. No, my Azoth. Lorenzo quite literally corrects himself, not even referring to Fiona by her name, but instead simply as my Azoth. She is an object to be used as they please, something that will benefit them, and she is expected to comply. Though, interestingly, the objectification in Haunting Ground is not exclusively sexual. This is certainly the case for Ricardo and Lorenzo, and we'll get to them in just a little bit. But with Debilitas and Daniela, it's different. Debilitus is, out of the entire cast, the most harmless, for lack of a better word. He does technically wish harm on Fiona and is a threat in the sense he can literally kill you, but it's coming from a place of misunderstanding. He doesn't understand that Fiona is a living, breathing human being and not a plaything, something he can't seem to differentiate. This is something he does eventually learn though, even letting her escape the castle by the ending. Out of every one of the antagonists, he is the only one you could say learns his wrongdoings and grows from it. And yet, despite these redeeming factors, he still objectifies Fiona in probably the most literal sense of the word. At first he sees her as a doll, just another one of his toys, but in the chapel when Fiona manages to subdue him, he begins to see her as a holy figure. He goes from seeing her as an object to play with, to seeing her almost as an object of worship, and while, yeah, sure, that's better in the long run because it means he'll leave Fiona alone, I wouldn't really say it's much better. It's still objectifying her, in a sense. He's still not seeing her as just a normal human who wants freedom and the choice to leave the castle. All that really happened is he saw her as one kind of object and now he sees her as another. I mean, it's literally in the phrase, isn't it? Object of worship. Despite this though, I still feel Debilitus isn't a villain in the story, not even close. He's simply misguided and if anything, his behavior is a commentary on how you can still objectify, how you can still cause harm without intending to. He shows us how ignorance and a lack of understanding, even if unintentional, can be just as harmful. Daniela is possibly the most interesting character of the bunch, and she's a fan favorite for a reason. She's easily the most mysterious character, as it's not even really very clear if she's human. Considering the major theme of alchemy in the game, many fans speculate if she is a homunculus, that is, an artificially created human through the science of alchemy. And it certainly adds up, given her almost robotic and inhuman behavior around Fiona. But I like to think she is, in fact, a fully biological, real human. I like to think she was kidnapped by the Belly Castle residents as a young girl and brainwashed into being the servant, the maid, the cook, all traditional household roles that historically were roles given to women. It's all she's grown up to be, it's all she's ever known. 
Much like how Fiona was brought to the castle for one specific purpose, so too was Daniela. She exists only to serve Lorenzo and Ricardo. It's unsurprising then, that when Fiona is brought to the castle and all of the residents are making such a big fuss about her, that Daniela's jealousy would kick in. Why is there so much adoration and reverence for Fiona when Daniela has been there the whole time? The only thing separating the two is Fiona's Azoth, her womb, something that Daniela doesn't have. And so when she has to serve Fiona, preparing clothes and cooking dinner for her, she snapped. This is when she decides to take matters into her own hands and take from Fiona what she believes she rightfully deserves. What makes Daniela so unsettling is how calm and collected she is. Even after she first starts stalking you, you can still find her continuing on with her daily tasks around the castle. Despite losing her mind and deciding to hunt down Fiona, she's still able to switch off her murderous tendencies to carry out her obligations as castle maid. Miss, it's cleaning time now. Even while chasing you, she doesn't say a word. She stands up straight and walks towards you with intent, her broken glass shard in hand. She still treats aggressive stalking and planned murder with the same elegance and integrity as any other task in her life. This robotic behavior sometimes breaks down during chases, when we can see Daniela lose her composure at random and break into manic, uncontrollable laughter, further showcasing her mental instability. I feel this dichotomy is enhanced by her chase music as well, which sounds like distorted robotic noises interspersed with female breathing, a pretty apt representation of her character. According to the cinematic director Naoto Takenaka, the Japanese horror film Joyure, known in English as Don't Look Up, was a major source of inspiration for Daniela's mannerisms and behavior. The female ghost in Joyure moves around in a very stilted, emotionless way, before breaking into fits of manic laughing, something Daniela mirrors in many of her scenes. <laughs> Okay. Though Daniela is clearly deeply unhappy with herself, and the only time we see this cold exterior break is when she passes a mirror while in pursuit of Fiona. Seeing her own reflection, she stops everything she's doing and breaks down, screaming and covering her face in terror. Daniela has lived such a monotonous life, 
doing chores and serving others, that she's grown to hate even the mere sight of herself. Ricardo even takes his frustrations out on Daniela, which obviously would worsen her sense of self-worth. So when Fiona arrives and is fawned over by the others for her Azoth, the self-hatred reached its breaking point. Not only does she hate herself though, but Fiona too, as we see in the stargazing room. <laughs> Blood, flesh, woman, you vile creature. You lure the man into your filthy body again and again, and you are allowed to do that because you are a precious, precious little prince. Precious. Precious little princess. <laughs> Daniela's jealousy of Fiona's womb, and ultimately what she deems to be her womanhood, has festered and grown so much to the point that it's warped into a hatred of all women. She's so desperate to be a real complete woman that those who already are have become her enemy. Believe it or not, it is indeed possible to be sexist towards people of your own gender. If all you grow up around are family and friends who have toxic mentalities towards women, you're likely going to harbour those same thoughts. Of course, having grown up and lived in a castle entirely run by men who only see women like Fiona as vessels for Azoth, it only makes sense that Daniela has adopted that same mentality. The same can be said for any gender, of course, but despite the leaps and bounds towards equality society has made in the past couple of decades, misogyny is still so inherently written into society that people like Daniela here really do exist. The real-world implications and reality that are reflected in Daniela's monologue here easily make this my favourite cutscene in the game. Perhaps that could be another reason why her reflection causes such upset. A hatred for women has even made the mere sight of her own female form revolting. But ultimately, Daniela's own weakness is used against her, as she lets out a blood-curdling scream, shattering the ceiling of the stargazing room and being impaled by one of the glass shards, smiling one last time before dying. The interesting thing about her death is she looked like she had plenty of time to move out of the way, but she chose not to, embracing her death. Perhaps you could argue she welcomes death because it means an end to her suffering. Or maybe you could say that she was searching so long to feel something, but she didn't realise that suffering, while not exactly a happy emotion, is feeling something. And as she realises that in her final moments, she dies with a smile on her face, content at at least having felt something. While Daniela's characterization is more so that of self-hatred, both herself and women as a whole, Ricardo and Lorenzo are completely different. In short, these two are predatory. I mean, I know all the stalkers in Haunting Ground are predatory by nature, but more specifically, their behaviour, their mentality towards Fiona is predatory. Ricardo thinks that by the very virtue of having the Azoth, by the very virtue of having this apparent gift, Fiona should be honoured to be their vessel. When she clearly isn't comfortable with this prospect, he's quick to point a gun at her. After all, according to him, if she isn't going to serve her purpose as his vessel, then she has no other reason to exist and should die. You miserable wench. You were given the greatest gift of all and you don't even appreciate it. I can't believe the Azoth was wasted on you. <laughs> Out of all the characters, he's easily the one who gets the closest to achieving his goal, as he manages to capture Fiona and imprison her. Luckily, she is saved by Huey, but if you fulfil certain ending requirements, you can get a very different outcome here, which I'll get to in just a bit. Ricardo uses noticeably more forceful language with Fiona than the other characters. At multiple points throughout the story, he says that he owns Fiona, that she, and more specifically her womb, belong to him. He even seems to get joy in tormenting her. At one point, he makes use of an alchemy formula to make himself turn invisible at will, and uses this advantage to torture Fiona even more. Ah, the formula is working then. It works directly on the eyes. You can't see me, can you? You are mine. I own you. You are mine. I own you. <laughs> 
This is all worsened by the fact that Ricardo and Fiona's father are clones, so in a technical sense, Ricardo is her uncle. Let me into your womb! While Ricardo is more direct and sadistic with his methods, Lorenzo is more manipulative. Throughout the majority of the game, we never see Lorenzo. Our only interaction with him is him giving us a note very early on directing us to his mansion. He promises he'll help us escape, and Fiona, having nothing else to work with, trusts him in an act of desperation. When we make it to the mansion, we discover Lorenzo simply lured us to his domain to make use of Fiona's Azov, no different from the rest. He manipulated her situation, persuading her to come to the mansion under the illusion that he'd help her escape, only to trap her there. And if that's not predatory, then I don't know what is. My dear Fiona, fate brought you back to me. Now, you are mine. All mine! <laughs> <laughs> While it's not until the very end that we meet Lorenzo face to face, he was in fact watching us from the very beginning. In an early cutscene when Fiona is getting dressed, Lorenzo is spying on her through a portrait on the wall, showing a more perverted, voyeuristic side to his character as well. Between Lorenzo and Ricardo, there is very purposeful direction in their cutscenes as well. I noticed that many scenes in the latter half of the game tended to use POV shots from the stalker's perspective which of course emphasizes the predatory nature of what they're doing. Ricardo and Lorenzo are preying on Fiona, and the player is forced to see it through their eyes. Take this cutscene for example, the first time Lorenzo de-ages from an elderly man to a middle-aged one. Daddy! the essence of life. We alchemists have the ability to convert it into power. We can live forever. Your Azoth Fiona belongs to me. This cutscene is heartbreaking to me, and the fact the POV camera forces you to watch the confusion and distress on Fiona's face is some very effective horror direction. Taking it another step further, you could even argue that the semi-fixed, pivoting camera angles during gameplay are intentional, like it could be someone out of sight watching Fiona. So, let's talk about the endings then. There's four in total, and we already discussed one of them, what I would argue is the best ending, where Debilitas sees Fiona off as she exits the castle. This is ending A, Fortes Fortuna Uat, meaning fortune favours the brave. Ending B is more or less the same ending, but without Debilitas. This is the ending you get if you killed him earlier on, a hard but perhaps necessary decision by Fiona which is reflected in the ending's name. Ignis Aurum Probat, or Fire Tests Gold. Much like gold is refined by fire, Fiona's character was refined through the hardship she endured, which could be both a good thing and a bad thing. After all, it would be naive to think Fiona's experiences won't leave a lasting negative effect on her. Ending C can only be gotten on a second playthrough. You must let Debilitus live, and when you go to his hut on the castle grounds, he'll give you a key. Using this key on one of the bathroom stalls brings you to a hidden area where you'll find the key to the main gates. Fiona escapes the castle with Huey, effectively cutting the entire game short. We see Lorenzo desperately trying to chase her down, loathing the fact she, and therefore the Azoth, have escaped. Some could argue this is the best ending, because Fiona went through the least amount of trauma possible, but I never saw it as such, because there's nothing to stop Lorenzo and Ricardo trying to capture her again. This ending is called Dona Nobis Pacem, or Give Us Peace. The final ending is achieved by having a poor relationship with Huey. Scolding him a lot and even hurting him physically will get you this ending, but why anyone would ever want to do that willingly is beyond me. When Ricardo chases after Fiona in the forest, Huey will not come to her rescue. Fiona wakes up in a glass box, and Ricardo taunts her as he tells her that he'll be born again using her Azoth. It then cuts to a few months later, with Fiona sitting in an armchair heavily pregnant. Ricardo looks at her fondly, and Fiona starts to laugh hysterically, seemingly having lost her mind. This ending is called Tu Fui Ego Eris. Silent Hill fans should be familiar with this name. Tu Fui Ego Eris? Weird writing. 
This means what you are, I was. What I am, you will be. Referring to the cycle of Ricardo's rebirth that Fiona has now unwillingly become part of. It's a very disturbing ending, but you really do have to go out of your way to get it. And honestly, treating Huey so poorly, you kind of deserve to get a bad ending. Haunting Ground is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the finest horror games ever made. Not only because its story is unique, effective, and could unsettle even the most hardcore of horror veterans, but the themes it touches upon are very real. The predatory nature of the Belly Castle residents is portrayed in a frighteningly realistic way, and sexual objectification and the struggle for autonomy over their own body are concepts that most women are no stranger to. If you take away the more fantastical elements of the story, like the alchemy and whatnot, it's unsurprising that Haunted Ground's story hits close to home for so many people. And that's exactly why I think Haunted Ground didn't do well back in 2005. It was very much ahead of its time, and if a game with just a female protagonist wasn't going to be taken seriously by critics, then a story that delves deep into female-centric issues most certainly had no hope. Many reviewers back in the day just said that Haunted Ground was a perverted, overtly sexual story that is told at Fiona's expense, and if that's all you take from the story, then you are missing the point. Every aspect of the stalkers and their behaviour was an intentional design choice to further drive home the severity and repulsive nature of Fiona's objectification. Fiona being sexualized is intentional. You are meant to be uncomfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, that means the horror worked. One reviewer, Lee Alexander, summed it up best when they said, Haunting Ground is a perfect illustration of how sexuality can be used to great effect. And I couldn't agree more. It embodies everything about stalker horror that is so terrifying to me, and plays on very real fears in an unapologetic, relentless way. If you want spoiler-free proof of what I mean, I dare you to listen to the game over screens, but don't say I didn't warn you. Haunting Ground definitely garnered a cult following years later, but it's a shame that the gaming industry wasn't mature enough yet to acknowledge its artistic direction at the time. Then again, this isn't the first time this has happened to a horror game. Silent Hill 2 released to okay-ish reviews back in the day, and only seemed to gain the level of respect it has now as the years went by. I'm starting to wonder if the real works of art tend to release to mediocre reviews because it takes years passing by and the culture moving on for people to realise how impactful they were in the first place. Regardless, mixed reviews and a limited print meant Resident Evil 4 left Haunting Ground in the dust, and now you have to fork out ridiculous amounts of cash to even own a physical copy. Fiona's cropped up the odd time in other games, probably her most memorable appearance being in Tatsunoko vs Capcom Ultimate All-Stars in Joe the Condor's ending, where he literally just blows up Belly Castle and saves Fiona. <laughs> Damn, I kinda wish this ending was actually in Haunting Ground now. But there's not been much effort in the way of preserving this game. With the recent resurgence in horror games, there is a chance it might see a re-release one day, but there's no word on any of that just yet. I recommend this game to absolutely anyone who wants to dip their toes into retro horror. To me, it's easily the next best horror game on the PS2 after the Resident Evils and Silent Hills, and that's saying a lot, considering the PS2 was filled to the brim with quality horror games. And you know, even though it's not technically a clock tower, at least not in my opinion, there are a few nods and references that I can appreciate, regardless of whether or not they were intentional. You know, like the save points being grandfather clocks and the hedge trimmer Stabilitas uses in the ending looking an awful lot like the Scissormans in the OG clock tower games. It very much has the spirit of clock tower, but it reaches psychological horror heights that that franchise never did, so it really is the best of both worlds. Even by modern day standards, it still plays exceptionally well once you get over the initial learning curve. <sighs> Finally, a good game. I really needed that after Nightgrade. That was more or less it when it came to Clock Tower and any games that were inspired by it. That is until a decade later, in 2018, when Remothered Tormented Fathers came out. A game that apparently takes massive inspiration from Haunting Ground and the Clock Tower franchise. This game's meant to be really solid, and I've heard it has a lot of nods to Clock Tower in it as well, which is always nice to see. In fact, it was apparently originally a fan remake of the original SNES Clock Tower before it ended up changing into a completely original title during development. It also has a sequel, Remothered Broken Porcelain, which is meant to be... not good? <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, we're going to jump in with an open mind, so next time we're going to be jumping into the Remothered franchise to see what it has to offer. So, look forward to it. Okay. Hello, and thank you so much for watching my video. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. 
This was a little bit more of a serious one given the themes of this game, but I really liked discussing Haunting Ground and I hope you enjoyed listening. I stream horror games over on Twitch. I actually just got finished up with a casual run of Haunting Ground over there, so do pop over sometime and say hi if that's your kind of vibe. And if you want to keep up with me outside of that, feel free to drop me a follow on Twitter. But regardless, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time as we play the Remothered games for the first time. Uh, bye bye.